All right, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so today we'll very briefly finish up um, space sur surface environments and then we'll go into physiology of space flight. Probably get about halfway through that and finish up the rest of that on Thursday. So just a couple of updates. Um, remember homework two, the radiation homework, radiation review homework is due now Thursday. Uh, if you've already handed it in, fantastic, but otherwise make sure you have it in Thursday before 3.30 um, mountain time um, or it will probably close on you. I know last time actually we had it a little bit later than that time, so if you were last minute, you probably were able to get it in, um, but you really will have to get it in by then or the, the D2L assignment will close. Again, same submission process as before. So we've graded homework one. Um, you can check your grades out on D2L, go on there and you can see your grade. In general, um, first of all, let me know if that for some reason doesn't work. Um, my mastery of D2L is limited, so I think it should be working fine, but let me know if you cannot find your grade on there. Um, I got an assignment from everyone, which is great. That probably, first of all, means that everyone is still enrolled in this class, um, but also um, that you were able to all get your, your homework ones in. Um, overall, I thought that they were quite good, and, and I think Kayla agreed with that. A couple of recommendations. Um, so I know we didn't ask for references. Did we give them a bonus point if they included references? I think we did give you a bonus point if you included references. And if I said I would give you a bonus point for answering a question, you also got your, your bonus point there. So if you have a grade that is greater than 100, 100 that is why. Um, but going forward, please do include those references, particularly for this um, radiation assignment. So how you do that again is a little bit up to you, but sort of a, a recent rule of thumb um, I don't really care too much exactly how you format your references as long as they're consistent. If you use you know, EasyBib or something online to do the formatting for you, that's totally fine. Um, if you want to use citation numbers or name and date, again, whatever works um, as long as you're consistent. And you know, try to have that associated with what information you're citing. So if it's information you know, in this particular sentence, I found maybe hopefully not exactly word for word unless you're quoting that. But um, you know, this piece of information that is the details that are in this sentence came from this source. If this whole paragraph um, is from information from one source, then you can cite it all the way at the end of the paragraph. Um, we're not gonna be too, too critical here, but I think it's a good habit to get into definitely going forward. Any questions about references? Um, other things, so I love when you put images and figures in there, and I, I go back and forth on how serious to be about this. I would say, we're probably not gonna mark you off on, on any of this type of stuff, but be a little bit cautious about it. When you're writing a report that's you know available for public release, you can't just use other people's images and put them in your presentation. Um, generally, you actually have to get their approval wherever that, that image was published, get their approval um, from the creator or the owner for your use. NASA has some of these images that are sort of generally available and other ones that are not. Um, in any case, you must cite them. Um, all that being said, I realize your homework is not really a sort of general public publication, so we're not gonna be too critical on this, but it's also, again, a good habit to get into. Um, other quick things, make sure to give a, a quick read-through, uh, maybe two quick read-throughs. I would say there's you know, a couple of spelling grammar type things in homework one. And then the other one is certainly read the assignment very carefully. Maybe after you've written it, go back and read the assignment and make sure you've actually done that. We had a couple cases that, that weren't human um, space flight accomplishments. So again, for, for number two, um, for homework two, try to do that. And if you have questions, again, feel free to email Kayla or myself, um, preferably not within the last 24 hours before it's due, um, but um, feel free to ask questions. Any other questions on homework two or homework going forward? Again, I think all the grades are very good, so I wouldn't, wouldn't stress it too much. So one administrative item. Um, I had said at the beginning that the first exam would be scheduled for September 27th, so this is sort of the original schedule. Today we'll do the first half of physiology, the second half of physiology on Thursday, first half of human factors and psychology on next Tuesday, and then the second half next Thursday. And originally I planned on doing a little bit of exam review in this class, the end of this class, and then having the exam here. Um, so this would be Tuesday the 27th. What I'm proposing and would prefer to do is to basically do the same thing except for have hold the exam off until Thursday that week, September 29th. That will make sure that we can get through all of human factors and psychology 
give a thorough exam review so we don't have it crunched in at the end of class. And if we have extra time, we'll go into the next topic, which is systems engineering. But systems engineering won't be on that exam. So it won't be like, you know, we're learning stuff the day before the exam. In general, probably all of the material will be covered at least a week before the exam. So um, you'll have that flexibility. The added challenge is there is a slight possibility that this class I won't be present for. I'm, oh man, we're going back to this, huh? Um, that this uh, Thursday next week class I won't be available for. I'm gonna be down in Houston in between those two classes for a um, piloted ga ga guidance navigation and control conference. Um, I should be back by that cl class, but if my flight is delayed, I won't be back and I'll let you know so you don't come. Um, but I don't want that to be the last class before the exam because otherwise we won't have a chance to make sure that we get to all the material and the exam review. So that's what I'm proposing. If this is a serious problem for you, please let me know. We can try to make appropriate accommodations. But I wanted to give you a heads up that I'm aiming for the exam to be September 29th as opposed to September 27th. Um, I figure there probably won't be too many complaints about moving the exam back, but um, if for some reason the 29th you know, you absolutely can't do, please let me know. We can try to make accommodations um, and we'll go from there, but I wanted to give you a heads up. So I wanted to check in on the semester design project, sort of how's it going. Um, I've gotten a couple of emails on team leads and so forth, haven't gotten them from every single group, so I sort of briefly wanted an update. I guess, quick show of hands, who's contacted everyone in their group and hasn't had has anyone had any trouble contacting a person in their group so far? Success, this is great. Um, how about raise your hand if your group has a team lead that you emailed me today? Or, or before today, but I haven't probably seen your email if you sent it today. Um, any groups that are still, it's totally fine, but if you're still waiting on making a team lead, a point of contact, please um, email maybe in the next 24 hours just so that I have someone. And then if you haven't already also sent me um, the time for your weekly meeting, um, try to do that in the next couple of days as well. Again, no super firm deadline, but um, we'll start to probably have those meetings maybe starting as early as next week. So me having an idea of when those are and so I can put them in my calendar um, will be helpful. Again, the team name, is there's no firm deadline on that, but, but the sooner you have that, send me all of this information. And then again, We'll probably, there'll probably be more information on this on Thursday, but in, if you wanted to get started, the first thing we'll do is working on developing your mission statement. So um, you can return to the slides from the beginning of the semester about mission statements and sort of what they look like and um, what needs to be included in those and start to formulate that. That would be the first assignment. But otherwise, I want to get through more of the material, so we'll probably go, come up with more milestones on Thursday. Yeah, young man. On Mondays at 7 p.m. Um, okay. So uh, I was wondering, is that would that be an issue? Like, because do you have to be able to attend our meetings? Um, uh, here's what I would recommend. I would I would say it would be beneficial if I can at least attend some of your team meetings. Um, and I probably won't come for the full hour and like you know watch you guys work. But I'll come <laughs> for the first 15 minutes and you know check in to see how things are going, see if there's any quick hand questions I can answer. Um, things that have come up, and maybe it's not the first 15 minutes, but somewhere during that hour. Um, I actually don't mind Monday evenings, so that's that would be fine. Um, I would say, as you start to put them together, send them to me if there's something that neither Kayla or I can ever attend. We might wanna rethink that time, but otherwise, um, I probably won't be at every single one at, at 7 p.m. on Mondays, but I'll, I'll be at a few of them then, for sure. Great, thanks. Any other? Questions? Also, yeah. Uh, yeah. For the mission statement, um, this came up during our meeting yesterday. Uh, so, we kind of have like, like kind of like two definitions of mission statement that we can think of. Like, are we talking about the mission statement of our statement uh, describing what our space missions want to do? The second one. Okay. Yeah. So it'll be sort of a, a more. I guess there is that sort of the high level objective and then you know, get down into a little more of the requirements, but this is sort of like what your space mission is going to do. So, um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Any other questions related to the project? Again, we'll probably spend 10 or 15 minutes, uh, maybe even longer um, on Thursday going through this, so we'll come back to this. 
All right, so we, we ran just a very little bit out of time on uh, surface environments. Um, just two quick things for the guys coming in. The ex you can watch the, um, the fancy video or whatever. I'm aiming to have the exam on the 20, uh, September 29th, Thursday, instead of Tuesday, September 27th. If that's an issue for you, if that absolutely can't work, please let me know as soon as possible, okay? I think everything else is, you, you can check it, but it's probably not absolutely catastrophic if you don't hear it. Um, all right, so picking up on spaceflight environments, so just to very quickly review, we talked about the moon. Remember, no atmosphere, gravity is about one-sixth Earth gravity. Um, no magnetic field, which means there's no drag forces, and as well as no radiation protection, um, at least from, from the magnetic field or from the atmosphere. Um, the average temperature varies pretty dramatically where you are, whether you're in the light or the dark, primarily because there is no atmosphere. So those temperatures um, have more difficulty um, circulating. The day length is about 30 days, so you would imagine most lunar missions would probably operate something similar to Earth so that it's easier for ground control since the sun will be up for a, a long period of time. Um, and then the escape velocity is, is quite a bit lower than, than what we have here on Earth. Um, Mars, remember it does have an atmosphere. Um, it's only 1% of as dense as the Earth's atmosphere, but that sort of 1% sort of in, in many ways makes all the difference. That atmosphere is mainly composed of CO2. There does seem to be at least ice water, um, possibly liquid, maybe very briny liquid water on Mars that, that may be useful for a variety of purposes. Gravity is about three-eighths Earth's gravity, so more than the moon, but obviously substantially less than here on Earth. There's no global magnetic field, but it does have a local, um, some local magnetic anomalies. And it's cold on Mars, but, but um, a little bit more of a stable temperature. And then the day length is just slightly more than 24 hours, which is a challenge, for, particularly for long duration missions, for syncing up the Earth day versus the, the, the Martian day or the Sol um, time. So the astronauts and ground control might be out of sync. Uh, and the escape velocity, um, again, is, is less than, than Earth, but more than, than uh, the moon. So those are sort of high level facts you should quickly be able to spot out um, about each of these, these destinations. We also talked about near Earth objects and I didn't include all those facts, but you can go back and review them. The one that we did not get to, um, and certainly there's sort of a limitless possibility, we could have a nice slide in here on uh, Proxima Centauri B, but we don't know too much about it, so I guess I couldn't tell you too much about it. Um, is Europa, which is actually one of Jupiter's moon and moons. And this is um, a really interesting and potentially really exciting um, destination for exploration. And the main reason is it's partially because we don't know everything about it, but also um, for a few reasons of, that we do know about it, it's a top location in our solar system at least for potential habitability of humans in the future, but also the possibility uh, currently of extraterrestrial life or, or in the past, current or past, I guess. Um, it's slightly smaller than Earth's moon. Uh, again, I mentioned Jupiter's moon, so pretty far away from us. But the bulk density suggests it's you know similar composition as terrestrial planets. However, and this is believed, but now it's sort of becoming more and more apparent. I think there's reasonable confidence among, amongst uh, <coughs> planetary astronomers that there's a outer layer of water, real you know H2O water around a pretty deep layer, sort of all around the entire surface of about 100 kilometers. Um, it's, so it's pretty thick. The top layer is frozen. You're far away from the sun, so it's really cold there. So the top layer should be frozen ice water. Um, but underneath that frozen upper crust of ice water, depending on who you ask, and most, I would say most planetary astronomers and, and various models think that there's some liquid uh, ocean underneath that ice. So if you delve down deep enough, the core of the planet is warm enough to actually heat up the water and keeps at least some of it liquid. Um, how deep is to be determined? It may be quite deep, you know, miles deep. So you can't just sort of break through with a, a pitch, ex, pitch axe, but if you delve deep enough, you may be able to actually get to, to liquid water. Um, the radiation at the surface of Europa is pretty intense. It would cause severe illness or death in humans. Um, so you would definitely need to, to come up with some substantial um, radiation exposure. Uh, it has essentially no atmosphere, a very tenuous atmosphere, um, which is composed you know, mostly of molecular oxygen. And we'll get to this here later, but the, in Pascal's, what's the, the density of our atmosphere here on Earth? And trick question, maybe at sea level, not here in Boulder. 
101.3 kilopascals. So this is micropascals and 0.1 of those. So, you know, a lot, lot less than that, that of the Earth, uh, 10 to the negative 12. Um, the surface temperature, maybe not surprisingly, is quite cold because you're farther away from the sun, uh, but does vary a little bit um, based upon whether you're at the equator versus the poles. Um, so not in the near term future is anyone necessarily planning on sending humans to Europa, but is definitely an interesting longer duration um, or a sort of more long term um, exploration location. And I, you know, I think, I don't know all of NASA's current plans, but I think there's there's been some substantial pushes and I would expect to continue to see that, you know, the next 20 years of looking at trying to do probes and so forth, because um, it is a really exciting exploration destination. Do you have a question for me? So high a solar system? Um, you know, I'm not 100% sure what makes it necessarily so much more extreme. I know that it's sort of, you have no atmosphere and no magnetic field, so you have not, none of the radiation protection that you would otherwise have, but I don't know necessarily why it's so much more extreme um, than you would have, say, at the moon. I, I'll double check that for you. Reasonable question. Um, so just as a summary for, um, surface environments, so you guys as space habitat systems design engineers, the important part, nice to know some of these facts, but you really need to be aware of the various environmental parameters, both those uh, in orbit around different planets or even in transfer orbits between planets, and then on the surface of those planets or planetary bodies. And particularly, you know, you know again, don't need to know all the facts, but you need to know how they affect your mission. So this includes the destination selection, where do you want to go for the mission? Um, so oftentimes that's sort of defined in your high level uh, mission statement, but sort of defined for you. But in many cases, um, it may not be. You need to think about these things in terms of vehicle design, obviously operations, launch mass requirements. Um, we'll talk more about ISRU later in the semester, but know what is available and what, what the possibilities are for um, in situ resource utilization and then any other factors related to those environments um, for ensuring mission success. So this is broadly, you know, know what the design variables you have to deal with are. And then the second part is um, sort of identify the, the key design drivers and try to figure out how they're gonna impact your space mission designs. Um, and again, that's probably more critical than memorizing the specifics and the values. A lot of that, the, the key part is that you can, you know where it is to be able to look it up. Um, so I guess having a broad idea of, you know, does Mars have an atmosphere, does the moon have an atmosphere, you should know, but knowing the exact details on percentages of composition, not, not quite as critical. All right, any other last minute questions on um, surface environments? All right. So now we're gonna jump into the physiology of space flight, which I guess is a bit of a confusing term. It's really the physiology of the human um, during space flight. The space flight doesn't have any physiology. Um, all right, so high level objectives. Again, these are the things that you hopefully by the end of actually really next lecture, you should, you should fully understand and be able to do. So identify the primary um, human life support needs. And we've talked about some of these things in the, in the first lecture or two, and we'll now kind of come back to them and delve a little bit more deeply into them. Hopefully you, you should be able to summarize um, long-term physiological adaptations to space flight. Some of this will mostly come on Thursday. Um, we'll definitely touch on the first one today. And then start really to relate human physiological needs to spacecraft uh, design requirement drivers. And again, this class is roughly broken up to these are all the things you need to be able to do for the human. So you're not getting too much into the solutions or the designs. Um, but start to know what the requirements might need to be, especially that then in the second half of the semester we can really delve into solutions and how we might fulfill those requirements. Um, so we've, I've been pushing this sort of approach even from the sort of first lecture and the basic idea is you have to start somewhere and let's start by defining the requirements for the human subsystem. So, you know, if you're a traditional systems engineer, you might worry about thermo subsystem structure subsystems, um, power subsystems, avionics, what have you. 
Here I'm just saying the human is another subsystem, so we can treat that subsystem and think about what the inputs need to be, what the outputs need to be, um, how, those, how that system interacts with other systems, and then try to build the spacecraft around that subsystem. So I guess we're maybe treating it a little bit different than every other subsystem and that we're maybe a little bit more centered on this subsystem, but in general, it's, no, it's not really necessarily all that different than any of the other subsystems, except for maybe the, the fault tolerances or the failure modes we have to take to another extreme compared to other subsystems that may be able to at least survive if that subsystem goes out for maybe a short period of time, I guess depending upon your subsystem. So again, we sort of push this, break it down into the tiers of what is absolutely needed, what would be nice to have, and what would sort of be the, I don't wanna say the fluff on top, but the, the, the other stuff. So keep the astronauts alive, keep them healthy, and these are the two that we're gonna cover today and tomorrow. And then the third one, which will really be most of next week, is how do we keep them happy? Um, particularly for long duration missions, your mission success is gonna, you can't have astronauts that feel terrible and um, aren't, you know, don't wanna be there if they're gonna, if the mission is six months, a year long. You might be able to get away with that for a few days, you can go on a terrible camping trip, but you wouldn't continue to, I don't, I'm making this up, you wouldn't continue to hike the Appalachian Trail if you hate hiking, right? So the happy is important. Um, so a couple of things that you should know in terms of terminology, these are all in your, from your book, but just so we have them all laid out in front of us. Homeostasis is just a sort of a fancy word of the, the human's dynamic equilibrium. So that's just sort of the, the the normal condition of the human body, and that might change as you put the, bo the body in sort of new um, environments. You might, you know, go to a new normal, but it's, you know, it's whatever that um, response is to that current environment or, or how you sort of reach equilibrium in that environment. So stressors, um, physiological stressors are environmentally driven. Um, they could also be, I guess, psychological. So these are things that are sort of challenges to the human. Adaptability, I put in red, it's not a real word, but it's my favorite word, um, is the capacity to maintain homeostasis under different stressors. So if you experience sort of different things that are you know, stressing or challenging compared to being here on Earth, how capable is the human body of maintaining homeostasis or adapting to that new environment? Um, adaptation or accommodation is sort of the, the shift in that set point, so it's the response to that stressor. This is the capacity to, to sort of do that adaptation. This is the actual process of doing that adaptation. Um, we'll talk, I think, probably next class on performance shaping fa factors or, or PSFs, um, sort of how, what are the different factors that, that cause, that, that, that drive this adaptation. Um, and then in addition to adaptation to space flight, we then need to think about, um, particularly for longer duration missions, readaptation post flight. Um, so this can be, as we often do now, return to Earth, but in the future um, also will be, you know, landing on the moon or landing on Mars for the first time. So sort of the change from the presumably microgravity um, space flight environment to um, the sort of post space flight, but still um, on some type of planetary body. And then it's important to think about how these readaptations might be exactly the same, or they might be a little bit different or maybe never fully accommodate back to the pre-flight baseline. Um, again, we'll talk about some of those things um, next class, but again, this is this idea that going in a space flight is not necessarily fully reversible. Um, so simply having been there is sort of could potentially change your, your post-flight baseline um, going forward, even if say you're returning to Earth. Any questions on terminology? Should be pretty straightforward, but these are just you know nice words to be able to, to know what they mean. Um, we'll continue to use them throughout the semester. Um, nice astronaut photo. All right, so we talked a little bit about staying alive, staying healthy, and staying happy. So staying alive, this is sort of the bare minimum basics to keep a human being alive. So that means the habitat, consumables, and waste streams. Um, taking care of those things. These are things that will either in the very, very short term or you know the reasonably near term will um, kill the astronauts. So this is the absolute highest priority. The second highest priority is keeping the astronauts healthy. Um, 
and we'll talk a lot about sort of some of the physiological changes, bone, muscle, cardiovascular, sensory motor, et cetera, type of changes, as well as countermeasures, which is just a fancy word for sort of solutions to overcome the space flight changes that we typically see in terms of our astronauts becoming unhealthy, trying to keep them healthy. And then, as I mentioned, the final step is, is staying happy, um, and we'll go through this mostly next week, so human factors, psychological needs. So um, you might have very cranky astronauts, and they may be withering away, but if they're alive, you've sort of at least met this. So I think it's useful in terms of engineering to understand where the requirements fit in this hierarchy. Um, in this lecture in particular, we're gonna talk a lot about normative values. Um, this is really important as we, as spacecraft engineers, um, want to design our spacecraft. It's really easy, say, to look at a power system and know what the inputs need to be, what the outputs need to be. A thermal system, how do we reach thermodynamic equilibrium? It's a little bit more challenging to do this for humans because every human is, can potentially be very different, and in any case is at least a little bit different. So usually we start by doing this design with some normative values. We have a value, any human, we're gonna assume they need this much oxygen, this much water. I guess I shouldn't give away the answers on the next slide. Um, the, these, thing, these many things going out at this many kilograms or volume per day. Um, but of course, it's important to keep in mind that these are averages and actually you know, depend upon things like genetic makeup, racial, racial and cultural background, gender or personal preferences, all types of various combinations. So when you actually get sort of to the more detailed designs, you'll need to at least understand the variability in that um, such that you can account for, you know, basically people of different sizes and shapes so that you can, you can fully address um, all of the variation that we see within humans. Um, when we're using normative values, you might find in different places there are different numbers, and so it's important that you cite where you got those numbers from. In general, the best place um, is this BVAD, which is NASA's Life Support Baseline Values and Assumptions document. Um, the link is right here. I'll also post it on D2L this afternoon. Um, and so that's a great place to start to figure out what these normative values look like um, and sort of as a very high level pass, one person needs this much, another person needs much that. Um, and then we've already talked about equus, but all of these go into and are sort of the drivers behind the uh, environmental control and life support sy system. Um, I showed this slide at the very beginning, but I sort of want to come back to this framework of thinking of trying to break what you need for your mission, and particularly for your project, now that we're getting into that, into what are the physics of the problem? You know, how are we gonna get from point A to point B? What does it take to stay in that orbit? You know, high level physics. And the physiology, what does it take to keep our astronauts alive? And that really comes from the ECO subsystem. This then feeds into the, the safety, so how do we, you know, they're alive, okay, but how do we keep them safe? Um, how safe do they need to be? And then the last part is, you know, broadly can be called operability, and the definition of that is a little vague, but, you know, this would include things like health, habitability, human factors, psychological concerns um, that we're going to touch upon the next two days. So um, we'll start today really delving into the physiology, and then we'll talk more about health and habitability and then human factors next week. Everyone knows what EQUA stands for, hopefully, at this point. Um, I'll be picking up on these acronyms throughout. All right, so a little, you've hopefully seen this plot before at one point. Hopefully you remember all of the inputs, all of the outputs, all of the things that uh, need to exist but aren't necessarily exactly inputs and outputs. So looking for volunteers to name one output, or one, sorry, one input. Let's start with inputs first. This is easy, Katya. Very good, another one? Food. Food. Yeah. Food? Solid food. Yep. And the last one? Yeah. Water. All right. So we've touched up on the first three. Now we got the easy ones out of the way. Who knows roughly how much oxygen do we need per crew member per day? You remember this off the top? 0.835. I said roughly, and that is the exact number, so I guess that <laughs> will count. Um, yeah, around one kilogram, 0.8 <laughs> kilograms per crew member per day. Um, these Numbers, again, all come from that BVAD document, so it's a good place to reference them. How about uh, potable water? Four. Drinking water? Four. Six. 3.6, four, I love all those numbers. I think the magic one is 3.9. How about food? This is you know, dry food. 0.6 kilograms, right? Yes, 
Very good, 0. 0.6 kilograms. All right, how about the outputs? Um, I know we've roughly broken them up into, and we'll start to use this framework. Let's start with things, outputs to the atmosphere subsystem. So this would be, you know, things that come out in the air. CO2. CO2, yep, that's, that's a standard one. And does anyone know off the top of their head <coughs> how much output of CO2 we have? About one kilogram a day. One, exactly. And so, again, you get a little <laughs> bit more CO2 output than O2, but roughly, right, we as humans breathe in O2, breathe out CO2, and that's roughly speaking sort of um, the one-to-one -one matching. Obviously, you add a little carbon, so it's not, not perfect, but um, you're in the neighborhood there. Other outputs? Solid waste. That's true, you jumped ahead, but atmosphere, atmosphere subsystem? <laughs> Heat. Heat. Heat, yes, another one? Trace contaminants. Trace contaminants. Water. And the last one, yes, absolutely, water. So that can be, you know, respired as you breathe it out, but also <laughs> respired when you sweat, um, output of water. So then let's move on to the waste subsystem. So these are all our green arrows. Um, we had solid waste, another one. Sure. Very good. Waste. Other half. Liquid waste, very good. And then the other type of output that needs to go into our, our waste subsystem. This is kind of a trick question. Wet solids? Yes, exactly. So there's there's the perspired H2O, which will be dealt with by our atmosphere subsystem, but there's also perspired um, solids, which will be need to, be need to be dealt with by our waste subsystem. And then things that are in parallel here, what else do we need in our cabin? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, Nitrogen and? Hygiene water. Yes. I guess we didn't talk too much about the numbers, but I'll throw them up there for you. Um, again, good idea to have some concept of where these things line up. Um, and some of these numbers, I mean, obviously that we don't know them, but pretty significant figures, but for our baseline values, that's reasonable. The big sort of open-ended one is sort of how much <laughs> is tolerable in terms of hygiene water. Um, you probably need to have a little bit of, of hygiene water even to you know, stay alive, but definitely to stay healthy. Um, in terms of staying happy, you might be able to get away with very, very li little if you don't want your astronauts to be too happy. If you want them to be clean and happy, you might need quite a bit of that. And that's a, really could be a, quite a driver in terms of, of mass. Um, so any other high level questions on this? This is, you don't, again, need to know three significant figures, but it's a good idea to have some idea of, hey, I need five astronauts for 10 <coughs> days. How much O2 is that gonna be like? Well, um, you know, 0.81 ish kilograms per crew member per day. Per day. I already forgot my example, but multiplied by that first number I said and the second number I said, and that would hopefully be your output. Um, here, same slide. I guess in addition, and we're gonna talk about this today is the cabin environment. So you'll need to think about the pressure and the gases that go into that cabin environment. And we'll delve into these in a lot of detail in the next slide. Temperature, um, relative humidity, and then deal with any contaminants. You don't necessarily want to provide those contaminants, but they will exist. Um, so how do we go about dealing with that? Um, all right. So very high level, what are the key environmental control parameters? Um, so when we're talking about the atmosphere, we'll talk about several of these different things, but gas composition, so how much of different types of gas um, what are, and as a result, what is the total as well as the partial pressures of those gases that go into um, making up your atmosphere? The temperature and the relative humidity um, are obviously a part of, of that, and then the contaminants. So we'll spend most of the rest of today talking about this, briefly talk about this, and then we'll probably leave this for Thursday. So the second thing is um, first consider sort of the, the range well, so first we need to know what sort of our needs are, but then, as I mentioned earlier, there's sort of a range of operational needs. So you might have some standards um, that you wanna build upon, but also how much degradation in that atmosphere can we tolerate? How much, say, CO2 can we tolerate in the environment before it starts to affect the health or the aliveness of our astronauts? Um, and then also sort of emergency. So there's a couple of places you can go to look up these things. Again, we don't need to necessarily memorize all of them, but I think it's important to have some idea at least of where some of these things come. So I will post um, 
SMAC, which is NASA's spacecraft maximum allowable concentration for airborne contaminant, contaminants, um, that sort of bound the allowable ranges of your spacecraft atmosphere. Um, and also the second document bounding the, the spacecraft atmosphere. And both of those that will be up on D2L in sort of the general folder. And then as I mentioned, probably not until next class will we go into secondary factors. Some of these we've touched on before, you know, radiation protection, acceleration, um, tolerable accelerations, obviously important for launch, re-entry, that type of stuff, um, vibration and noise, illumination, and then we'll also touch upon some of the more physiology, bone loss, muscle loss, cardiovascular, but we won't go too, too deep into that. Um, if you've already taken um, the spring course, Space Life Sciences, then you will have already seen that material, and if not, um, be ready for that in the spring, since I, I would imagine that's probably the sequence that you're taking these classes. All right, let's jump into the atmosphere composition. So um, you should know Dalton's law of partial pressure. Um, pretty straightforward. Um, the total pressure, the, the total barometric pressure, is the partial pressure of, say, nitrogen, plus partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of CO2, um, water, any other gas that you have <coughs> composing your atmosphere. And so you just add those partial pressures up, that's your total um, overall barometric pressure. So I guess it's worth sort of understanding our own atmosphere here on Earth. With this small caveat, this is sort of your standard mean sea level atmosphere, so actually we don't quite accomplish this um, here in Boulder, but gives you an idea of sort of the standard. So as you guys correctly stated at the beginning, the total barometric pressure is a little over 101 kilopascals, or equivalently, and there's unfortunately so many different units for pressure, 760 uh, millimeters mercury, 14.7 um, psi. And of that pressure, it's roughly broken up into Mostly nitrogen, about 79% of the total pressure, the, the partial pressure of nitrogen is about 79% of the atmospheric pressure, and the partial pressure of oxygen is about 21%. So those are the two major things that make up almost the exact total, and I mean, hopefully if you add these two things together, you'll get 100%. So you could basically take this equation and just have these two. In reality, we also have a few sort of trace amounts of various things. So we have CO2, um, which is about 0 0.04 um, partial pressure or equivalently 400, and this is a common term, parts per million, um, just to sort of make those trace things have sort of somewhat more meaningful units. Um, still a very small amount of carbon dioxide, so right now when you're breathing in, you're breathing in almost entirely nitrogen and oxygen, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and a little bit of various other trace things, but those are the, the, the main things. Um, and then the relative humidity, obviously varies depending on where you are and the day and so forth. The, the um, MSL or the, the mean sea level is 40 to 50% um, relative humidity. And again, the way sort of relative humidity works, a bit of a, a messy scale, but it's roughly sort of how much, com it's, it's the humidity relative to the maximum humidity that the water or that your air can sort of take in water above a body of water. So it's sort of a, in a relative sense, maximum humidity, 100% humidity is sort of as much water as that air can, can reasonably take in. Oh, so I actually wanted to just say one other thing on this. So at a very high level, what you oftentimes want to do is ignore all of this stuff. There should be a button somewhere that I can press back again. Um, and just say the total barometric pressure is the nitrogen pressure plus the, the first pressure of nitrogen and partial pressure of oxygen. You may want to fix, say, the partial pressure of oxygen, and then depending upon your design, you may need to have some constraints on the barometric pressure. Um, we'll go into sort of the trade-offs of having a one atmosphere barometric pressure versus a lower atmospheric barometric pressure. Generally speaking, we don't go to higher um, hyperbaric conditions to take us I think it's probably on the next slide. And then you can sort of figure out how much inert gas, how much uh, nitrogen you need to fill out to make these things add together, okay? And then, so that's sort of a very high level analysis and obviously there will be carbon dioxide, water, other things in the air, but they're, you know, very, very small amounts. So you can get roughly one atmosphere or whatever desired atmosphere you'd like um, taking that approach. 
So now that I've said that CO2 and so forth is not important, of course, CO2 is important. Um, as I mentioned, typical CO2 levels here on Earth are about 400 parts per million. In the spacecraft, it's really difficult to maintain um, your CO2 levels being that low, um, at least in our sort of modern spacecraft, maybe in futuristic spacecraft with plants growing all over our spacecraft, we'll be able to get that lower. But in general, that's hard. So usually, you know, ISS, space shuttle, et cetera, you're, you're in the neighborhood of 0 0.2, 0 0.4%. So much potentially, or point, point, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. So potentially a much higher uh, parts per million. I'm missing a zero on one of those. Point, 0 0.02 to 0 0.4, two to 4,000 parts per million. So you could end up with much higher carbon dioxide levels, say on the International Space Station. And in fact, that's really an average across the whole space station. And one of the challenges, and I think I already have this on another slide, is um, air circulation is very difficult in microgravity. You don't have sort of the same convective mixing of gases. And as a result, you get sort of pockets potentially of very high CO2. So if an astronaut is working in one specific area and not moving around very much, all of that breathing out of CO2 will cause a little pocket that could be much higher, actually, you know, in the neighborhood of even 1%. And roughly, again, roughly speaking, 10,000 parts per million or about one full, a full 1% of the partial pressure, if that 1% partial pressure is CO2, that's sort of a safety limit. You don't want to be breathing a lot more CO2 than that or it can, come become, can become poisonous. Um, so as I mentioned, you'll generally make up your atmosphere of however much partial pressure of oxygen you want. And then you have usually a design of the total barometric pressure and you need to fill the rest of that in with an inert gas. Typically, as it is here on Earth, that is typically nitrogen. Um, although you could use other inert gases and, and a potential option, although I, I'm unaware of any other spacecrafts that have actually used nitrogen. I think helium is pretty much just used in deep sea diving. Um, but you could use helium and there are some trade-offs. So helium is, is less soluble, which means um, it doesn't sort of get stuck in your blood and therefore, um, we'll talk about this in a second, but when you want to do an EVA and you're transferring between a, for example, on ISS, a one um, atmospheric uh, total barometric pressure to a lower um, atmospheric pressure, you need to do this pre-breathe. You basically get the nitrogen in your blood out. So you need to breathe pretty much pure oxygen to try to get that nitrogen uh, in your blood out or you will have something similar to the bends um, that we'll actually talk about more on Thursday. So hydrogen has that advantage, less pre-breathe time, easier to do those EVAs. Um, it's resistant to ionizing radiation, which is nice for radiation protection. Um, it's about one seventh the density of, of nitrogen. So that's beneficial in terms of saving mass on, on how much you need um, to actually launch up in terms of your atmosphere. And also, you know, the things that get expended or leak out um, replacing that. It has about six times greater th thermal conductivity, so it's sort of a little bit um, easier for, for uh, thermal control, but it also has higher leakage. So if you have seals, uh, particularly you know, on gloves or so forth, um, places where gases can leak out, helium might have a little bit more leakage than you would have for nitrogen. And of course, everyone's favorite um, party game trick, it shifts your speech, which is you know, both annoying, but also it can make it difficult for communication. So if people are sort of speaking in a high-pitched voice and it's an emergency situation and you can't understand them, then that's an issue. So that's maybe one of the leading ones. And this is why, as far as I know, every space flight mission has used um, nitrogen if they're gonna use an inert gas to, to cut the oxygen. So let's pause there and do a two minute break and then we'll continue along. It's the same process. You're going from, so in the bend, you're going from like very high pressure to no pressure, whereas in the spacecraft, you're going from one atmosphere to less than one atmosphere, but the exact same process. If you have nitrogen in your blood, it effectively boils out uh, very painful and can kill you. Thank you. 
figured that comic really would keep me in it. <laughs> This still works cool, so that's how I use it. Okay, yeah. I don't utilize this as much as I should, but. I actually thought it was the guys with fours, because I, I have one too, but I didn't bring it. I was like, how is this here? That I don't know. Can you turn it back on? Uh, I turned it off. But get me lazy. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Oh, interesting. So it's getting reused in both in Jupiter and the Sun. Okay. Makes sense, yeah, yeah, right, because that would make sense why it's better at the pools, yeah. Let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so quick oxygen level terminology. These things not only apply to, to space flight, but you may hear these things in, I don't know, very other, various other uh, air, aircraft or aerospace applications. So norm oxic means normal, maybe not surprisingly, normal physiological oxygen. So this means one atmosphere at standard sea level. 21% um, oxygen, so it's sort of just similar to exactly like, not what we would experience here, but what we experience if we were um, at sea level. Hypoxic, hypoxic or hypoxic um, is deficient amounts of oxygen reaching um, body tissues, and this gives rise to a series of adaptive physiological responses. Depending upon how, how hypoxic you are, um, this can be, you know, be a problem almost immediately or it can be a problem over a longer period of time. 
anoxic is the absence of oxygen, so you're sort of breathing, but there's no oxygen in the air to breathe. Um, obviously, it's catastrophic very quickly. And hyper, hyperoxic um, is an excessive amount of oxygen. So you think, oh, that should be good. Um, you go to oxygen bars and tr breathe pure oxygen, that is good, um, at least for a short period of time. But if you have too much O2, particularly too much um, high pressure O2, then that can become a concern, particularly over a longer period of time. So there are time dependent limits, and I think I have that um, on the next slide. So again, O2 toxi toxicity, the exposure is time and pressure dependent. Um, so there's some trade-offs there, and there's various tables that you can look up to get these trade-offs, but some sort of rough ideas. If you have 100% O2, that can eventually lead to these tox toxicity limits, chronic poisoning. To give you a little bit of an idea, if you have you know, 10 to 14.7 PSI, so near, the, near our Earth atmosphere, 100% O2, if you have you're probably okay, you start to have issues around six hours in a 24 hour period, so you don't wanna to push too much. If you have lower pressure, you can do sort of higher periods over a longer period of time. And there's, you're generally okay if you have um, a low enough pressure, so 3.1 to six PSI, so less than sort of half of an Earth atmosphere. Um, if, even if that's 100% O2, you won't have oxygen uh, poisoning or oxygen toxicity. The Apollo astronauts, for example, lived with um, for about two weeks, including you know, transit, their time on uh, the lunar surface, EVAs, and so, so forth back, up to about two weeks at five PSI and 100% O2. So it certainly can be done, um, but you don't wanna sort of push too much beyond that. You certainly wanna want one atmosphere, 100% O2 for days or weeks on end. Um, so some of these issues actually come up with deep diving, so you start to get this, this saturation, if you have um, partial pressure of O2 at say four atmospheres, so really, really high um, levels of, of uh, oxygen, four times say what we have here on Earth, and you could have issues really quickly, you know, 30, 40 minutes, um, you could be in a coma. So we think of oxygen being as good, but obviously, well, maybe, maybe not so obviously, but pretty much everything that's good for us, too much of it, not so good for humans. So that's sort of a summary of the atmosphere. Again, in your book, they go through a lot more on the, on the trade-off, so I certainly highly recommend you read that. Um, but it was pretty well covered in the book, so I'm not gonna go into too much more detail. Now we'll sort of transition to temperature. Um, so one of the fun terminologies here, shirt sleeve environment. So this is a sort of environment, an atmosphere, and a temperature that is comfortable more or less to hang out sort of in regular clothing like you're wearing today. Maybe not so much like this classroom that everyone thinks is cold. Um, I guess if you're up here in front of the bright lights, it's not nearly as cold. Um, so this means there's no pressure garment required to live comfortably in that environment. So roughly, obviously, depending upon the person, that's somewhere around 18 to 24 degrees Celsius. Um, for most of these, I'll use the, the, uh, the Celsius units, and if you were curious what those come out to in Fahrenheit, you'd do the math, but it's good to know them in those Celsius units. In addition to just the atmospheric temperature that will need to be maintained in this range, and you're normally around 21 Celsius, so sort of your you know, 70 degrees pleasant um, environment here in the classroom. There's also limits that have been set in terms of touch temperature, so when you touch something, um, how hot it can be or how cold it can be. I didn't actually put up a cold one. I think the cold one's about four degrees Celsius. Ideally for hotness, we like to design to around no hotter than, than 40, uh, degrees Celsius, but in terms of upper limits, you can go up to about 45 degrees Celsius for continuously touching, so if you're touching something for an extended period of time. Um, if you are very momentarily touching something, it's okay if it goes up to about 49 degrees Celsius, but you don't want it to go any higher than that because obviously you would, you'd burn yourself. Um, and some of these things obviously depend upon you know, the, the person's skin conductivity, but also um, exactly what you're touching, but this is important for switches and knobs and things that you have to touch with your bare hands. Um, so the safety of this obviously is implemented by design. Um, so bimetallic thermal switches, um, sensors to make sure things that you could be touching are not too hot, software controls, um, et cetera, are things that you need to incorporate such that for the human, we can maintain that sort of more narrow band of temperature allowance. All right, so how about 
relative humidity. So the comfort range for relative humidity, again, we try to design our atmospheric pressure as you know, 40 to 50% um, relative humidity. A comfort range, and this is maybe a little bit on the, on the wider side, is, is 25 to 75%. Um, of course, <laughs> here in Boulder, we aren't typically in that range. So um, if you have, if you go too high, let's say you have 100% humidity on the International Space Station, what are some of the challenges that we think we might encounter? Yep, short circuiting, condensation. Any other ones? Bacteria growth. I can't hear the one from back. Bacteria. You mess up your air processing. Yep. Devices. Yes, absolutely. Air processing. A lot of a lot of the electrical and mechanical um, things don't work well when you're in a high <coughs> high humidity. Um, they can rust. They can um, things can. I, I almost said the last one. Final one. Bacterial growth. Yes, exactly. Great guess. Microbial growth. So you could have. Um, I mean, obviously pretty straightforward there, but here we're trying to create life in space, but not necessarily all life in space. Um, how about if you go too low? Hopefully this is, these are the things we're all familiar with in Boulder. Um, some of them are comfort issues, right? Dry skin, nosebleeds, but also pretty serious health issues. Um, if you stay in a really low um, relative humidity environment for a long time, you, you know, cracked skin actually can lead to increased likelihood of illness. So it can be a, a pretty serious issue for health as well. And then I guess the final thing is just to be aware the relative humidity interacts with the uh, temperature comfort zone. So if you live, say, in places that are high humidity environments versus here in Boulder, you'd be well aware of this, that you might be able to tolerate a colder day or a hotter day here in Boulder because the humidity is relatively lower. If you're in Florida, for example, for a particular launch and it might be 95 degrees and you say, oh, that's not too bad in Boulder, that can be quite sweltering and uncomfortable um, in a high humidity environment. So just be aware that those two things interact. Try to aim, aim for around 50% comfort range um, for relative humidity in space habitat environments. So I briefly touched on this earlier, airflow and ventilation is really an issue um, in microgravity, it might not be all that obvious. Certainly when you look at pictures, you would never think about this, but um, without the gravity environment, you don't have normal uh, convection. So the air sort of doesn't circulate in the same way, and so air pockets can build up. Um, and this is really an issue for CO2 in particular because we have these really, really expensive um, and a pain to deal with CO2 emitters on our space habitats, which are the astronauts. Um, and they tend to emit, if they're not moving around in one particular place, which is as they're breathing out, they emit CO2 and also emit other things, right? Sweat, particulate, aerosol, um, all accumulate right around the astronauts, which is also sort of the worst place for those things to be. Um, so it's actually a good idea for the astronauts to move around, but it's also important that we come up with uh, airflow and ventilation techniques that will help keep the air circulating um, and in fact, Part of the reason, say, the ISS is quite so loud is really just the fans that are helping to circulate that air. Um, we talked a little bit about um, emissions here. Obviously, you can get larger emissions when you're exer exercising versus nominal conditions. Um, so you sort of need to take that into account when you're, if you're interested in doing exercise, which we'll talk about a whole bunch um, next class unless we happen to get to it today. And then, of course, for the astronauts, that you need to avoid dead spots. So if you're in an area where there's sort of no ventilation or no flow, it's probably not a good place to hang out for a few hours. You need to sort of be moving around. So contaminants, obviously, these are not things you need to design for, but you need to design to deal with. Um, so SMAC, uh, which I defined earlier, was, um, I don't remember what I what I had written down on the, on the previous slide, will be posted on uh, D2L, also table 5.6 and some of the NASA docs that I'll post give sort of allowable amounts of contaminants. Um, these are, you don't need to know necessarily all that much detail on the physiology behind why that's allowable, but at least it will give you a standard to then design to. Um, in addition, contaminants, the um, volatile organic compounds, so these are sort of organic chemicals just like off-gassing off can occur going outside your spacecraft and be out in the space environment and be getting on the outside of your shuttle windows, for example, you also can have off-gassing um, inside. And this is sort of your standard new car smell. Um, if, that's too, if it's low enough, it's not that big of a deal. If it's uh, more, 
more intense, that could be can be an issue. Um, obviously, particulates don't settle in microgravity, so these things are just floating out in the air. You know, like when you go in a corner of the room and like wipe your hand and realize all the junk that's in the corner of the room because you have it vacuum right there, those things don't go to the corner of the room in microgravity. They're floating around and they're what you're breathing. So you need to think about those contaminants and how you can clear out those contaminants. Obviously, cleaners, adhesives, lubricants, um, things that sort of have more chemically stuff in it um, can be a concern. We talked about microorganisms. This one is an interesting one and really an issue as you go to longer and longer um, space missions. Um, things fall off of the human body that you might not notice because if they fall into your carpet, you won't see them again um, until you vacuum them up. But hair, skin, nails um, are all issues that then just float around in space. So sort of vacuuming in space and cleaning all this up is, is quite an issue. Um, human metabolism actually outputs, you know, you think I made that, that uh, or the, of the graph, you know, of CO2 emission and water emission. Um, obviously you actually emit several other things that are more trace contaminants. So there's a whole list of them in table 517, but major ones are methane, ammonia, hydrogen. Um, as you're emitting those either from your skin or from breathing, um, they can build up, so obviously need to be dealt with as well. And then we talked about last class, if we're going to a planetary surface, say the moon or Mars, that lunar dust, if you're going outside and then coming back in your habitat, um, really gets everywhere and can not, isn't great to breathe. So it's a, a serious contaminant that you'll, you'll need to deal with. Um, and again, all these things have to be dealt with by design as well as operations. And generally speaking, you know, this is done by having adequate vent ventilation and also filtration or removal of these things so that you can uh, make sure these levels stay low. And actually one of the, the big challenges here is also just sensing. You need to sort of be able to know what is in your atmosphere so that you can properly um, deal with those issues. Yeah, question, comment, come here. Actually, filtration and censoring of the air, do they dust the equipment once in a while? Do they, I mean, I don't know if the dust saddles or is it the continuously moving around? So it, it can settle a little bit, but mostly, I, to my understanding at least, is like more off electrical settling. So if you know, if you have some thing that has electrical current running through it, it might want to settle more on that thing. Um, but you know, they're, they're, it won't settle by gravity, so it won't have a tendency to sort of go down per se. It can settle in areas that don't have good ventilation or flu throw, so or, you, through flow. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you have a particular air pocket like around a corner or something that doesn't get much, um, I'm not even gonna try again, uh, yeah. then that dust certainly could settle there. But yeah, you'll cleaning and sort of vacuuming in space is definitely an issue of trying to clean up these particulates. Um, and then the ventilation, general ventilation system. So if you can get the air flowing, just like when you're on an airplane, right? Get the air flowing and then you have, you know, vents that suck it in, clean it out and then re-emit it. Any, yeah. What's the current procedure for cleaning particles out of the air on the ISS? There's some, I know there's some stuff that's sort of passive, right? So these, these there's a flu throat. I'm just gonna give up on that, that term <laughs> thing. But you have the flowing air and it will be sort of a duct that will suck in the air, clean it out and then and spout it out on the other side. I do think there's some active things that the astronauts do, but outside of that, I don't, I don't know specific procedures. But maybe, maybe Jill, yeah. How bad is the contamination for microbial uh, uh, viruses and stuff like that right now? Because we have we had this device up there since nineteen nineties, right? Yeah. It's been up there for a while, and if there is no really really settling locations, there is no way of really refining these microbials so they can be anywhere yep. in the system. How bad is that? Do we know? So I mean, well, it's a it's a good question. I. I I don't know if we really know, um, but the astronauts seem to be clean back, you know, relatively okay. So I guess that's sort of somewhat good news. I would say, I mean, so in the air ventilation system, like it goes through a filter that hopefully cleans out, you know, what, what's your standard thing that you get in your home ventilation? 99.9% .9 of microbes are removed in this air ventilation system. So similar type of setup that as it goes through that system, we can clean out some of that, but obviously, you know, if the air ventilation isn't perfect, that doesn't 
clean out all parts. So, so it does probably build up over time, but I guess it isn't maybe the, the leading issue. Does anyone else have any other comments on that? I'm maybe not giving the most clean answer there. Okay. Oh. Well, yeah, Kimmy. I know the spot Kelly came back and with a couple of abnormal rashes that they said mm -hmm. it could be the microbial ones. I don't know how bad, like how we say that clean rooms are 10,000 particles. I don't know how through past 20 years that has changed. Oh, yeah. No, I don't, I don't think it's, stuff. you're even close to that. No, absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. Um, yeah. In fact, I mean, there is some evidence that like, you know, pe people tend to get more sick yeah. in space than they would here on Earth. So is that a function of the human's immune system versus just sort of a less clean environment that they're living in, breathing air that your neighbor has breathed in? So. Um, I don't think it's terrible, but it's, I don't, it's certainly not a clean room level, so yes. Thank you. And of course, I mean, in future systems, it'll sort of be a function of what engineering design that you come up with for that particular system, but yeah. Um, so again, I mentioned your book really goes through this total and partial pressure trade-off. This is uh, an important one. Um, and really something that oftentimes you have to decide fairly early because it will design, de define a lot of the other portions of your design. Um, so the basic idea, right, is that you need to create a certain level of oxygen, but that doesn't necessarily define your total pressure. So you could have, you know, no other inert gas, pure 100% oxygen at a, you know, at a, a partial pressure that's, you know, similar to here on Earth so that you can breathe, but then the net barometric pressure would be less. Or you could try to replicate the one total atmospheric barometric pressure by filling the rest of that with some inert gas, presumably nitrogen. So sort of, not traditionally, but certainly recently, we've taken an approach of the one atmospheric pressure. Um, and there's some advantages and disadvantages going between those two that you should at least be a little bit aware of. And I'll go through some of them here. I certainly would recommend uh, checking out your book as well that has a pretty comprehensive list, actually. So. Um, the first one is if you have a higher total barometric pressure, that's what affects the structure. The structure doesn't really care all that much about how much oxygen versus nitrogen you have. It cares about the total pressure. Um, so your structure, your pressure vessel now needs to be able to withstand that increased pressure um, relative to obviously the near vacuum or near vacuum of outer space. Um, that's also a function of gravity and you know launch and so forth. So there's other factors there, but certainly that's one factor. Um, leakage is an issue, so just like a balloon, if you have a high internal pressure, that airflow will go out faster. Um, it's harder to maintain, um, and you have to replace sort of the, the, the refilling of the gases as you have leakage, for, and that's more of an issue with a higher pressure. Um, convecting cooling capacity is an issue, and all, uh, as I mentioned, also a function of gravity. We talked about inert gases, whether that's nitrogen or um, helium. Um, we didn't talk too much about EVA pre-breathe requirements. We'll have at least one, maybe two lectures on EVA specifically, so I'll just touch on this at a very high level. Um, for EVAs, we currently use pressurized spacesuits, so you'll basically have a pressurized atmosphere in your spacesuit surrounding your entire body, including your head. The challenge with that is that if you want to move, it's similar to having like a long balloon. When you bend that long balloon in half, it wants to snap back to a normal position, so it's difficult to move in your spacesuit. To try to overcome that, it's better to have a lower total barometric pressure in your spacesuit. So in your spacesuit, you often have a more pure 100% oxygen environment. And in fact, in our current spacesuits, we have a, a pure 100% oxygen environment to reduce the total barometric pressure. So it's not backfill with a bunch of inert gas. The problem with this is you need to transition. If you have a one Earth or one atmosphere in your spacecraft, and then you want to do an EVA, you need to transition. And like I mentioned earlier, you can't transition from a high um, total pressure to a low total pressure, particularly if that um, high total pressure has nitrogen in the environment because the nitrogen um, gets into your blood. Totally fine when you're in that environment. We have lots of nitrogen in our blood right now. But when you take away that pressure, the nitrogen will actually effectively boil out of your blood. That causes what's called the bends, if you're familiar with this in diving. It can be very painful, and if actually done too quick, it can lead to death. So it's pretty serious condition. Um, and so the way we overcome that is doing pre-breathe. So the astronauts, 
basically the night before they do an EVA, we'll sit in a room that transitions and goes to a 100% oxygen environment, breathe in that oxygen, breathe out oxygen slash nitrogen, get that nitrogen out of their blood, such that when they then go to a, do an EVA, you don't have as much of a concern of that. The challenge here is then there's time before you can do an EVA. So among the many flaws in the movie Gravity, you cannot just jump out of a spacecraft into an EVA suit and go do something because you will have terrible bends and then it won't go well for you. Yeah, question. Because you're from MBL, are you familiar with Deva Newman's work with the spacesuits? Yep. So would that kind of get around this? Would they be able to provide like one atmosphere just by putting it on no. and then you can go directly out? <laughs> Katie so, worked a little bit on this. Yeah, so I actually guy. worked on the bio suit for about two years. And basically there's the same, so our baseline was about 30 kilopascals is the pressure that we wanted the suit to supply. I don't know exactly what the current EMU is, but it, it's around that, I think 30, 33. Yeah, we'll, I don't know the number. Does anyone know that number off the top of their head? It's in the, it's in the it's neighborhood. We'll go into the, um, the area, I mean, so basically that introduces a lot of other issues. So the suit that we're talking about, for everyone who doesn't know, um, basically it's a super tight suit, so it provides the pressure by the tightness of the material rather than the pressure, or rather than the, um, like, pressurized suit. So it doesn't get away from the transition in pressure. So you're still going from one atmosphere to about a third of an atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, like 30 kilopascals or something. Yeah, so our baseline was like 29.6, but like similar to that. So it's still not providing the full atmosphere. That would be a very uncomfortable suit. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. The advantage, one of the potential really strong advantages of a, a mechanical counter pressure suit where you provide the pressure on your skin through a mechanical, basically, it's like wearing Under Armour that's like way too tight for you, right? So it like squeezes your skin effectively. Um, similar to the, how the atmosphere here on Earth right now pushes on your skin from all directions. The air and the atmosphere, you know, those molecules are bouncing off your skin and keeping that, that compressed or that pressure on your skin. The potential advantage is I mentioned how when you try to move your arms in a pressurized suit, it's, you're not only moving your arm, you are also sort of displacing that gas. So it takes actual energy and work to do that. So it's actually quite fatiguing to do EVAs. And I guess we, we should probably get um, some more comments on that if we, if we had our call-in system here. But in any case, mechanical counterpressure suits at least offer the potential promise of not having to do that because you don't, you don't have to fight against that. The pressure is from the garment itself, not from the atmosphere surrounding it. So um, that's a, a potential promise there. So in terms of other issues here, um, when you have a higher percent oxygen, you have a potential for flammability. This was, um, as we talked about earlier, the cause of the Apollo 1 um, fire. So this can be a, obviously a pretty serious limitation and one of the, the real drivers in why we um, say on the ISS use one um, Earth atmosphere is that by cutting our total atmosphere with some nitrogen, the air is less flammable if you have a spark or some type of ignition, then that's less likely to cause um, you know, flames and explosions. Um, we talked about communication for helium versus nitrogen. Um, also, if you have less atmosphere, you know, you need to have an atmosphere for your voice to travel through. Sound won't travel through no atmosphere. So if you have a more dense atmosphere, then it's easier to communicate long distances. If you have a very, very low atmosphere, then you can't communicate through those long distances. Um, scientific requirements are actually important. So if you're trying to do an experiment, say a physics experiment that very specifically focuses on having gravity versus microgravity, if now you are also changing the atmosphere from what we have on Earth, then you sort of have this confounding factor. So um, in terms of a scientific laboratory, there's advantages to having replicate what we have here on Earth, except for the gravity, um, the microgravity. This is also an issue on, you know, when you're in space, it, you can have sort of whatever atmosphere you want as long as you're providing enough oxygen. Um, but you need to normalize usually during launch and reentry. So you need to worry about depressurization and repressurization during those phases. Um, and then depending again upon your scenario, operational and emergency situations, if you needed to do an emergency EVA, you know, would it even be possible to actually get out of the spacecraft um, and into an EVA suit if you needed to? So again, check out some of the discussion in your book there. It goes on for a couple of pages, but I think some pretty good coverage, yeah. If the suits are 100% oxygen, how do they mitigate the flammability risks? <laughs> good question, very good question. Um, a very careful design in your spacesuit. Um, the, the short answer is you can't, I don't wanna say this because I'm, I'm sure there's 
definitely people listening in that are super experts in ABA, but you, you really wouldn't be able to move in a spacesuit that's a, a one atmosphere spacesuit. It's, it would be, I mean, you'd be sitting there like the Michelin Man and not be able to move. <laughs> um, so we have to go down a little bit. Um, and yeah, so you, you, you basically, you try to reduce any source that might start a fire within your spacesuit. Um, so very careful with design. There's also strict <coughs> requirements for the fabrics and everything, obviously. Static. Yep. Yeah. Yep. yeah. If you have the lower pressure anyways, your fire danger is pretty much gone. Like mm -hmm. Apollo, the Apollo 1 had the high absolute pressure. Right, so yeah, I mean this this is, yeah, a good point, right, exactly. Is if you can right, have l less oxygen molecules sort of per space, then your flammability can still remain lower. Yeah. So that sort of covers our nominal um, atmosphere. It's also important, um, particularly in scenarios um, where we're sort of looking at failure modes and so forth, one of sort of the worst things that can happen, happen in a space mission is depressurization. So we need to have some understanding of nominal versus degraded atmosphere. Um, certainly there are cases, as I continue to talk, we have two minutes of a class, so I'm gonna stop right there. Sorry for, for running out of time, I was too busy answering fun questions. Um, and we'll pick this up on Thursday. Remember your homeworks are due on Thursday. Please email me if September 29th does not work for your exam. Did, did students, remember you have one week from that 29th to do your exam, so it doesn't have to happen exactly on the 29th.